Yeah, g'day guys, and welcome back to the Slathe channel. Now this week I'm going to need to cut some dovetails, and while I've got these dovetail cutters here, and a cute little wooden block, the biggest one is still pretty small, and I thought it would theoretically just fit and should be able to cut this dovetail. I do need to do quite a lot of them, and therefore I'm kind of doubt that this cutter is going to last for that long. So let's make a bigger one. I've got a bunch of these TCMT inserts. They're only the small ones, 11 millimeter enclosed circle, but they are the right angle, 60 degrees, and it should be just tall enough to cut the entire dovetail. How much bigger could I make this cutter? Well, if I needed to, I could guess I could go as wide as about sort of 44 millimeters or so, but realistically you only want to cut one side at a time, so something about 35. So what am I going to make the new shaft out of? Uh, that'll do it. This is a bit of high strength, I think 4340 steel, which I was making a shaft for my dual gearbox, and I kind of screwed it up. So then I used it for testing out making woodruff key cutting slots, but I can see just the right size to get a dovetail cutter out of here. Just need to touch off. Now normally I'd just part off that excess, but unfortunately I need to get a new insert parting tool holder, so... I put a link to the saw in an earlier video, and someone pointed out that it was like 90 bucks in America. I think the issue is that Bayco doesn't import this Model 319 to America. Amazon probably was going to ship it to you from Europe. In Europe it only costs like 19 bucks 50 or so, and it's fantastic. Right, I'll just take some very light cuts just to straighten up that end. Right, to do the cut off, I'll just hold it in here.
I don't want to bite my nice accurate shaft with these teeth, so just switch over to collets, I think. And since I've got it, I should probably put it on. Well, well, that's all the turning finished. But before I start milling, I need just to tweak a milling cutter. Now taking a close look at one of these inserts, you can see that they have quite a bit of side relief. It's seven degrees. When I cut the pockets for these to seed into, I'm gonna need a cutter that can do a seven degree wall for about two and a half millimeters in height. I've got this Imperial 3 8 end mill, two flute, and the corners are a bit chewed up. That one's not too bad, but this one's got quite a big chip out of it. So I think that'll be perfect for cleaning up with that seven degree angle on the end of it. And then I'll use that to cut the seat. So have you guys started watching the MotoGP season again? Sure looks like Marc Marquez and Pedro Acosta are gonna shake things up a bit this season, huh? I wonder what used to go in here. Whatever it was, I didn't get it. So for this end mill sharpening job, I need the universal head. This one's not original. It was made by the friend of mine, Franz who sold me the Clarkson tool and cutter grinder. But it's very close to the original design though. Right, I'll just switch out the ER16 shaft. These are just Chinese import collet chucks with the one inch shank, which is what most of the Clarkson tooling takes. With tool grinding, normally hand tight's tight enough. Right, I also need to switch out for a cup wheel and take off this extension. You know, one thing that drives me nuts on this machine is that while there's a flat on the extension, there's no flat or anti-rotation pin on the spindle itself. So to get that off, the best method I've found is a spanner on the extension and the slip jaw parallel pliers on the spindle. It doesn't take much force, but it's still a pain. They should have put some sort of wrenching flat or something on the spindle. Oops. Ah. The original Clarkson version of this universal tool holder has an alignment key in the bottom of it so that it always fits square to the table. I actually quite like it this way because now I can swing it if I need to 90 degrees and it really doesn't take much effort just to line it with a square. Now the next thing needed is to set up the indexing finger to make sure the end mill is horizontal when it's indexed. I use this big Joe block. Okay, you can see it's not quite horizontal, but once I grind it back a bit, it'll move to horizontal. Now the tip of this mill is pretty worn. I'll work on the secondary relief angle first, which is probably going to be, what, 10 degrees? I'll have a look once I touch it off. Ah, that looks like it's more like 15. Maybe even 20. And of course, now that I've set so much back relief, the height of the wheel's wrong. A wee bit more. All 
Right now that's cleaned up, I can reset to do the primary angles, which let me guess, 8 degrees, something like that. Let's take a look, it doesn't take much. Okay, so that primary relief is a bit on the wide side, but I think I'll leave it like that. Now I need to grind those seven degree angled bits off the edge there. Right, so for that, let's rotate the whole thing through 90 degrees. Then on to one of the cool features of the Clarkson, the split table. Okay, now for this job I need 7 degrees, so there's 5, and let's call that about 7. Remember this is an imperial machine, so you have to convert. So I've now repositioned it with that 7 degrees. I had to move the wheel head down a bit, and I've got it set up with the finger adjusted so I can do a bit of a little fluke grind as I come out. So let's give that a shot. Okay, so this is the first time I've ever done flute grinding, so I guess we'll see whether that was both enough and correct geometry. I'm not exactly sure I've got enough back rake there. Maybe I'll just move the finger to allow a little bit more back rake on that last portion. I can really see why all of the high quality flute grinders have some sort of air bearing. It's really quite difficult to get a nice smooth feed just guiding off the flutes like that with the friction inside this sliding surface here. Right, I'll do a test cut, see what it looks like. Just got a bit of crappy uh, mild steel, just some off cut, nothing special. Right, let's see if this is going to work. Okay, so that cut fine, although the wall angle seems somewhat less than 7 degrees. So let's set up the dovetail cutter and have at it. Given that I ground this tool and I was a bit suspect on the amount of back relief it had, I took very conservative cuts. Hey, so far so good with the first stop, except that I knocked this corner off, forgetting to set the Z height the first time. That's not a killer failure, just shows it wasn't made by a robot. I also wasn't that sure how much overhang to give the insert but I guess we'll see if that's the correct amount. It's definitely plenty of clearance on both cutting edges for, for the insert to cut without rubbing the body. Next check, did I get that uh, center where I wanted it? Mm, I wanted it biased towards the edge so it pulls the insert into the side. Hope that's not too much offset. I don't know why the hydraulic release button on my pendant didn't work when I first pushed it and I was walking over to push the other button and then it did release so just put another bloody ding in my table with that tool falling out. The tool itself looks undamaged. Guess the cast iron broke the fall.
Okay, that all seems to work. So, let's do tooth number two. Okay, well that's the milling finished. Next up I need to tap those four little holes, so I'll leave it in this fixture for now. That'll help me with the alignment of the tap. So I need M2.5, but I got this little set here. They must be in here, and... Oh, bugger. So I've got everything from M1 to M2. Three, four, five, six, and upwards, but... I don't own an M2.5. Hmm. And it's Saturday afternoon. Okay, turns out the local tool shop, Sconce, also doesn't have M2.5, but not all is lost. Luckily, here I am at my mate Franz's place, and I know he's got every single tap known to man. And in addition, he's just picked up this beautiful, kind of a copy of a Dekel FP3, which he's just been pulling apart so that he can scrape it back in and give it a good overhaul. Well, it looks like I forgot to turn the mic on for this next bit, probably for the best considering all the expletives, but you'll see. It was about here in the process that I started getting chatty. <laughs> I'm not sure how Franz got so good at removing taps, seeing as I'm assuming he never breaks any, but he's got good dexterity for it. Okay, so that's good. The roses have come back from their radical pruning quite nicely. First tulips of the year are out. And I could already make a rhubarb crumble. Yum. All right, let's give this a bit of a deburr. It was very nice of Franz to let me go out there and ruin one of his taps. Now I owe him a tap set, but hey, saved the day. That was brilliant. Thanks a lot. Well, it looks quite pretty. Let's hope it works. To test this out, I'm just going to use some crappy old, like, flame cut steel. Okay, let's try this thing out.
Okay, well that was a pretty aggressive test, doing the pretty much the whole dovetail and bit over one big pass. Yeah, when I actually do the parts, I'll be a little less aggressive, I guess. But hey, seems to work nicely. And it looks like it survived that aggressive first test quite admirably. I don't see any breakout on the inserts. Let's call this a successful tool. And for my Patreons, I'm going to do an Easter machining livestream. If you're into that, come and join me. Thanks a lot for watching.